Your works merge reality and poetry, and your book, Considering Women, is a perfect mix of poetry and reportage. Why do you use this union? Um, I think as writers, we write out of different needs and different interests. Uh, and there are fantastic writers that I admire that write about very neutral, wonderful daily things like nature and stones and trees and clouds, and I wish I could do that too. But writing for me has been uh, more urgent. I write out of need. I feel that somebody has to say these stories. And for me, I'm very much a storyteller. In fact, I started my writing uh, as a short story writer. And um, there's an urgency to telling these stories, to giving certain people a voice. Now, I'm very aware of the ethical dilemmas that come with this because um, as a person who gives voice, Uh, you're also making a name for yourself and making success in your life. And sometimes you feel ethically uneasy. On the other hand, if you don't tell these stories, they probably won't be told. So that it's, it's a delicate balance to get it right. I think what matters to me is, as a writer is to tell the truth. And the truth is not the basic factual details, but the truth about human existence. Um, about the horrible things that sometimes we do each other and the power and resources that we draw on to recover. Okay. Are there women considering self-telling as a therapy or they are all tired that someone picks their wounds? Yes, um, the women I interviewed for my research, the genocide survivors, um, some of them choose not to talk anymore uh, because, as you said, they are fed up with their wounds being picked, with them. Um, people visiting them once again and asking them about that and reducing their whole life story to that. Uh, I think that's something that's ethically very wrong, to reduce human beings to victimhood, to the victim story, because they are much more than that. There was a period before that, there's been a period after. It was difficult for some people to talk because they felt that talking doesn't improve anything. It doesn't improve their situation. All it does is to renew the pain, and they're left alone to deal with the consequences of that because there's no therapy, you know, therapy is very new in Kurdistan, um, and so on. But some of them also tell their story because they want to counter that main discourse that portrays them in a certain way. Everyday life turning against characters is a common theme in your poems. The body turns against men and women after gas attacks. The strings from one of your poems you used to use for swinging became the strings which strangle Kurdish yachts. How do you relate now with the objects you have seen transforming? The, what I guess what I wanted to convey is that once there is violent conflict somewhere, nothing is neutral anymore. Uh, I have other poems, uh, my first teenage love story, which is about uh, two young couple, two young people sort of looking at each other on the roof. You know, we have these flat roofs and you sleep on the roof in the summer. And they never speak because they're too shy. And then they meet again once he's lost his hand and he can't paint anymore. So all of our love stories, our childhood stories, our stones, our neutral places like bread, you know, a woman I met once said, I cannot have warm bread because until my son died, he asked for bread. And it always reminds me of his hunger. So all the small things that um, would be normal, ordinary, unnoticed things in the world become contaminated with tragedy. And I wanted to see, to, to, to show that, how violence interrupts all of that and kills all the domesticity and normality around everyday events. Mother was a poet, and you started writing poems very young. Can we talk about a Kurdish cultural spring? It's like Kurdish people taking back the beauty they were deprived of, the burning trees and the denied songs that appear in your books. There are many discourses clashing with each other. So you have the conservative Islamic imams clashing with the feminists all the time. You have the nationalists who want independence from Iraq, from those who believe in equality and... Uh, pluralism and diversity. You, you have those who want an Islamic uh, constitution and those who want a secular constitution. So there are many discourses are being had and many clashes, but it's also why I, I believed it was the right time for me to go back. 
In one of your poems, you say you will inherit your mother's pots and kitchen, but you won't inherit her garden. According to you, is poetry an inheritance? Is there anything you won't leave to your daughter? Yeah, it's interesting. I guess when I wrote that poem, I will never inherit my mother's trees. Trees are about roots, uh, about land, about connection to the land. And at the time, I felt that I was never going to go home. It turns out that I was wrong. I wish I could leave her a lot of laughter. Uh, I work very hard, so I don't want her to work so hard. Which is the book you would read again and why? I think I would like to read Marquise's books once more. I read them years and years ago, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and um, I love them, yes. I, I am now not remembering some of them, and I feel bad about that. Um, I would love to read uh, William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury once again. I love that book. 